Welcome to New England Lacrosse Journal's Chasing the Gold podcast, your destination for all things lacrosse. I'm your host, Kyle Devitt. Alongside me, Mr. Jack Catelli. Jack, how we doing? Pretty good. Not bad. Pretty good? No, no, no. <laughs> you came in here like a house on fire. You, you have your little Jack attack moment, and you just go with it. Let's go. Yeah, well. I want to hear it. You know, I'm not, you know I'm not a big social media guy. I mean, I'm on social media a little bit, but you, I mean, you make a living on it, right? So uh, I'm, I'm on social media. I'm going through some la- lacrosse stories and this, and all of a sudden, I see this video, and I can't believe my eyes. I just can't believe my eyes. Coach, I don't know if you saw this or not, but this mother runs out onto the field to defend her son. It's a high school game. Yes. High school game. Now, when your son gets to high school, he should be able to, you know, fight for himself maybe a little bit. You don't shouldn't have to hold his hand. So it was just a little scrum, and the mother starts running on the field screaming, that's my son, that's my son, and started pointing at the guy and told the guy to get get away. Get away. This is high school lacrosse. What's wrong with these parents? You know what's even worse? After looking at the video again, I think it's a showcase. I'm oh, almost wow. positive it's a showcase because it has, like, kind of the mountains in the background, and everyone's got pennies on, and they're wearing different helmets. So that would tell me that it's not a high school game. It's it's more of a showcase, which actually does that. How much worse does that make it for you as a club guy? Because you, you run a club team. How much worse does that make it for you? In terms of what? In terms of like the level of Karen that's being displayed. It's terrible. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And it, what, what the coach is going to say? Oh, yeah, we'd love to have your son on campus and you can come as well if you want. You know, we'd love to have you on campuses too, mom, you know, because we know exactly what you're all about now. Your son's not going to get recruited anymore. Yeah. And you know what? Your son has a number on the back of his jersey, and it lines up with the roster. So we know we know his first name and his last name. And you know what? We know he's your son now. Yeah, and if it's a tournament, you're going to know almost everything else, probably going to have GPA in there and yep, all that stuff. Yep, so, yep. you know, it might be one of those things where the coaches do the silent um they do the have you seen have you heard this i've talked about this before on the podcast with uh we had a we had a coach on that i can't name and he told me after we were done recording he's like oh i put an 11 next to kids names who's have who have really crazy parents and i'm like why and he's like oh because then if they see the number behind me they see oh 11 he must be getting recruited and then when i get home i draw a line between the top of the one and the bottom of the one and write a little zero next to it and then it becomes no and I think it's the fun, the fun, it's the best explanation I've ever seen. Cause I saw him do it at a tournament. I was like, what does 11 mean? That's weird. That kid's not very good. And then I asked him about it and that's what happened. So, yeah, it uh, means no. Kids, kids are no, big, yeah. gonna be a big no energy for me, dog. But uh, speaking of which, uh, actually the opposite of that, yes energy. We have union head coach, Derek Witherford with us today on the podcast. Coach, how are we doing? Happy to be here guys. Thanks for having me. No, thank you for listening to that amazing rant by Jack. We're going to actually pipe in audio of that confrontation and maybe put it in the video format because we are now out. It's okay to announce this. We have the soft launch of this channel. We are putting us on YouTube for some reason. We're putting our two somewhat somewhat attractive faces in front of everyone to make fun of i can't wait it's gonna be great well you really gotta speak for yourself on that face thing yeah you know? i All know right. i'm more than somewhat attractive i agree you're right well i'm glad you guys both dressed up for this then yeah <laughs> thanks so <coach>. we do <laughs> coach i gotta ask you i mean you played at union you're an all-american defenseman a couple of years captain and you know you've been a great role model great ambassador of the game um played in high school great player recruited went through the whole process what if that was your mom running out onto the field um, when you, you know, you were banging it up as a defender and she came running on the field trying to defend you? How, how would you feel about that? Well, it, it's funny. That video must be circulating around because my mother might, might just as adept at social media as you are. She actually sent me that video the other day. Is uh, that right? <laughs> wow. I actually saw it. And uh, if, if anything, that would be someone else's mother probably hitting me on, on the video. So uh, I don't think she would be doing it. I was doing most of the hitting back uh, when I was playing. But wouldn't you be embarrassed if your mother ran out in the field like that? A hundred percent. And uh, it, it, it's a sad moment in, in the club world when that becomes the uh, norm. So I'm uh, glad we don't see too much of that anymore. Well, you know what the problem with that video is? It's, it's the pressure. 
not only the kids, but the parents put so much pressure on themselves and then they put pressure on their kids. And that's a perfect example, you know, of the, things are so tense and, you know, my kid's got to play well and that's my son and that can't happen. And he's, he's out there trying to get recruited and, oh my God, oh my God. And then they snap, they snap. And it's, it's a process. Relax. Your son's going to end up at a good place. Leave him alone. Correct, coach? Correct. And, 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 and when the parents get to the college level with their players, then the coaches really don't have much communication with the parents, do they? Uh, n- not, not that I'm aware of. So we have team mothers that uh, communicate through, um, you know, through email and, and phone and text, um, you know, to the other parents to kind of um, to, to be a voice of reason throughout the, uh, throughout the program. So, you know, we have one mother that I kind of talk to on the regular that, then kind of broadcast the message out. Um, so that's how we kind of limit our um, interactions with coaches. But, uh, you know, I, I talk to any parent, anytime, anywhere. I, you know, they're paying a lot of their money. Um, send their school, a uh, kid to a school like Union. So, um, you know, I, I do talk to parents, but it, it uh, you know, within reason and about certain things. Let me ask you, do you ever talk to parents about playing time? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. You do. Wow. Sometimes. Yeah. There's a better man than me. I never, I was like, coach, I was like, you're in college, man. Why, why? I like, I, I get it that, that it can happen. I, I'm not saying it can't happen or, or that it's wrong to talk to parents, but like, I remember a parent sending an email and I got the email and I read it and it was like, you're running the kids too much. And yeah. I went, okay. And I printed the email out and I walked to practice the next day and I read it out loud without anyone's name. And I was like, Hey guys, do you think you're running too much? Are you complaining to your parents that you're running too much? And they're like, no coach, like immediately they knew they were in trouble. They're like, no coach. And I was like, oh, that's good. Um, take all your gear off. We're running today. We're just going to run around the campus. <laughs> and they're like, what? And I was like, oh no, I'm serious. And there was snow outside. I was like, no, you bundle up. We're taking a couple runs. And then they did one. And then they came back. They're like, all right, we ready to practice. I'm like, no, 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 go again. You know, like it was just that kind of thing. Like you, that, for me, that was like a lower level program. So I have to instill the discipline, right? Like that's, that's like my goal, right? The goals are different for each division, especially division three programs. Like, I feel like we've talked about this on the show a lot of times, the evolution of division three into more than just like a place you could go and maybe play lacrosse is so complete in the last 10 years into a higher echelon of competitiveness. Right. And you're no better example than union, right? Like you, you've elevated that program to the point where you're in the national championship game and you're in one of the toughest leagues in the country in terms of week by week guys, the the teams that you play against. So can you talk a little bit about how that has happened for you in the last, especially the last four or five years at union? Yeah, well, it it really starts with, uh, the school's administration hiring a full-time lacrosse coach, which um, yep. didn't happen until um, Andrew Higgins, um, Jack's nephew, uh, freshman year. So um, in, in 2008 was the first time they've ever hired a, a full-time lacrosse coach at Union. And, um, you know, and, and I was the first recruiting class from Paul Wareham um, who took over as, as the first full-time head coach. So I think, um, you know, that that was a huge moment in uh, – in, in the history of the program. And I think they've supported the program um, to get to that level. So, um, you know, with, with, with money, with um, assistance, um, with head coaches and, um, you know, letting us travel and do some other things that uh, we need to do to make this a um, fully funded and um, program that's respectable. Coach, you've had great start to the season. You're two and zero. You beat Babson. You beat Endicott. Scored twenty seven goals and allowed fifteen. Only six in the last contest. Uh, you like to run and gun a lot. Um, do you do you plan on continuing that that pace um, throughout the season, depending upon who you're you're, you're playing against? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think we're a team that can play multiple different styles, and I think that uh, that hopefully showed last year. But, um, you know, it really, I think the strength of our team, if I had to name one this year, would be our defensive midfielders and LSMs. Um, I think we have some really strong players at the middle of the field that can, um, one, play great defense, but then I also have some good, um, you know, have some good game to them, push and transition. So um, we want to let those guys run when we can. And I think it's a fun, fun brand of lacrosse to play and uh, kind of 
encourage those guys to buy in defensively because then they get a little bit of a, a chance to score on offense. So, um, you know, I, I think that's something we encourage at practice and with our uh, our coaching staff and, our, and us watching film. How can we attack and transition? Yeah, Coach, before I ever actually met you in person or virtually, I had heard about union staff being at every single event. Like, I think like two years ago when I started really – diving into the club scene in the summer circuit. And I was just like, what is union doing here? You know, like it doesn't seem like the wheelhouse, but really now the wheelhouse is much bigger for everybody, right? It's not just, uh, people aren't just recruiting in their region for these division three schools. They, they go and find the best talent possible. And, and you're a mass guy. So it would make sense. You come, come back home and, and grab some really talented players. I mean, all you have to do is go up and down your roster. It's like a ton a lot of, of mass guys. Kids. It's a lot of ISL kids. It's public schools. It's private. It's other private schools, Catholic schools. So, can you kind of share how that became your recruiting philosophy? Is you know to to go back home and and find these talents and bring them to Union. Yeah, um, I, I think the the hardest part of recruiting is um, is getting your name out there. So I, I think if someone knows about Union, it's a lot easier to recruit that individual. Um, and, and I think we had a little bit of a foothold in Massachusetts and, uh, you know, New Jersey and the Northeast, but, um, you know, going back to mass was easy for me. You know, you stay at your parents' house when you're a 22 year old assistant or if your buddy's house, uh, in Boston and, um, you know, you go as much events as you can and try to recruit and, uh, stop using up the college's budget as much as you can. So uh, that, that's where it started for me. And we started getting in with some really good programs, some really good high schools. They were sending us some great kids. And then once they start having success at Union, the thing starts rolling by itself. Meaning if you have a great kid from LS and he has a great experience, he's going home to his hometown and telling all his buddies about Union. And now that we start getting a couple more, getting one or two every year, and uh, you start establishing pipelines and relationships with uh, coaches and players. So, um, you know, that's kind of how it started. Um, we used to be a public school team. And now we're getting, as you said, a lot more ISL kids and private school kids and uh, even some prep school kids as well. So it's, um, it, it's growing as much as it can every year. We're going to take a quick break, but there's more Chasing the Goal podcast on the way. All right, class, it's the NCAA Men's Lacrosse Championships. Welcome to Fandom 101. Want to hype up your squad from face-off to the final whistle? Here's your assignment. Lesson one, get loud for every goal. Two, work together. And three, attendance is encouraged, but passion is mandatory. The Men's Lacrosse Championships, May 27th and 29th at Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia. Buy your tickets today at NCAA.com slash mlacrosse. Class dismissed. All right, class, it's the NCAA Division I Women's Lacrosse Championship. Welcome to Fandom 101. Want to give your team the ultimate assist on the lax field? Here's your assignment. Lesson one, get loud for every goal. Two, work in groups. And three, attendance is encouraged, but passion is mandatory. The Division I Women's Lacrosse Championship, May 26th and 28th at Wake Med Soccer Park in Cary, North Carolina. Buy your tickets today at NCAA.com slash WLacrosse. Class dismissed. Dedication, skills, focus, and the drive to play at the highest level. Lachsachusetts is committed to providing the coaching and curriculum that will allow boys and girls to learn and grow as individuals and as teammates. With an emphasis on skill development and academic excellence, their players have led the country in college recruiting for the past 10 years. With over 800-plus players moving on to play in college and over 130-plus high school All-Americans, Lachsachusetts has been able to set the nationwide standard unmatched in the sport of lacrosse. To learn more, log on to laxachusetts.com. That's laxachusetts.com. Building that kind of pipeline philosophy now that I'm on the other end of it as a high school coach, I'm kind of like, hey, let's try and get guys to places where they fit. And Jack and I talk about this off mic and on mic. We're just like, if you if you help a kid get into a place that he either doesn't fit or isn't going to play, like that doesn't really help anybody. Right. It doesn't help. Right. the kid. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help the coach. It doesn't help the program. It doesn't help your program that you're coaching, whether it be a club or high school. So I, th I think it's, all, it's always interesting to hear coaches talk about that and how that happens. Right. And it's not always like the first kid is really good. So I got another kid. Right. It's it's kind of like, OK, he worked really hard. He's got a similar mindset. He's connected to this kid, this coach. And that is what builds the trust. 
right? Correct. hundred percent. And, um, you know, a lot of that goes down to the kid's character, um, but also just the IQ they're getting taught in high schools um, and, and club programs. You know, are they making them play two ways? Are they making them, um, are they doing ground ball work and stuff that we value uh, in the recruiting process? So I think having those esta uh, established relationships in the club scene and the high school scene, um, you know, is, is super important. Coach, when you look at a player, you look at a player, obviously, academically, it's it's difficult to be accepted at Union, high academic standards, uh, and you brought the program to, you know, national prominence being in the championship game last year. But when you look at a player, you don't always look at him as, oh, he's going to play for me my freshman year. You look at a player, this kid's going to help me at some point, correct? Yeah, yeah, and you want to find their strengths. Um, you know, what is this kid really good at? Um, what does he do better than anybody else? And then can you use that to your advantage? Um, it's really hard. Um, I talked to Kyle uh, about this with his, um, his article he wrote on Peter Burns. It's really hard to find ex-attackmen in college. It's really hard. Everyone's recruiting those guys. Um, you know, we, recru we recruited Peter Burns, who was a first-team All-American last year as a crease attackman, and he developed. But we started recruiting him because, hey, he could really finish at an elite level. So we look at him and say, hey, we can use that. We can use that. And then he had the work ethic to develop and, um, you know, kind of the mindset to get better and better every year. But, um, you know, it's we want to find someone that's really good at at least one thing. Now, how did that evolve him playing X and becoming an All-American first team? Is that something you saw in him and asked him to work on himself? Or is it something that just came naturally and he progressed as the years went on? Yeah, he progressed. Um, he grew, actually, in college, um, put on a lot of weight in, in the weight room, put on, um, you know, I would say about 25 pounds of muscle, um, but then also just developed his game from um, being a crease attackman to, you know, as, as we run drills, you know, you can't just always stay on the crease and, and really showed us that he's able to do other things and gain the coaches, coaching staff's uh, trust to, to be able to play X and uh, play even above the cage at times as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of the things that you spoke about earlier was that you guys play a different, you can adapt your style to who you're playing and also impose your will at the same time. There aren't a lot of teams that can do that. And the teams that can do that are usually the teams that make it to Memorial Day weekend. Uh, and I think, you know, no better evidence of that already being the case than me watching the, your first two games where the offense in particular is so good at finding the hole to attack and finding the weak point in the defense. And it's, uh, it's a lot of what, you know, not to compare levels, but what does Cornell do better than almost any other team in the NCAA in terms of offense, Jack? Find the weak defenseman. And move the ball. And move the ball. And move the ball. And I think that's one of the real strengths of, of Union as, a, as an offense, especially in settled sets, is they can always kind of pick. It's not even just picking on D-mids because everyone does that. It's trying to find, like, okay, who doesn't approach well and how can you attack his feet? How can you, you know, get a switch? How can you run off this pick to get a clean look to the inside? And that's one of the things that I think really separates programs in D3 from there. There is like, I mean, there's like 400 programs, right? It's like 400 D3 programs. The top 30 or 40 are just so much better than the bottom 200, 300 teams. And it, it's because they build the culture, they build tradition, and they have, you know, good players and they develop players, right? I think that's one of the things that Division Three is so good at. No better example in my mind than Peter Burns, who, you know, in high school, I talked to his high school coach. He was a, he literally just ran around and dunked the ball. And he was small and he got killed and he got right back up and he did it again. And that kind of mentality prepares you to carry the ball. That kind of mentality gets you, ready to take a hit and to make the extra pass. And, you know, I just think it's, it's interesting that your program is so good because of a guy like that developing into a top tier player. How, what's your approach on player development in general? It's, it's gotta be the number one goal. I mean, um, as we were talking about recruiting in the first couple questions here, we think we're a pretty good program and we're still not getting the recruits that we think um, we should be getting. 
um, we have to still develop a lot of our players and we are still getting uh, killed by a lot of other schools um, that we think we should be out recruiting. So um, what we will try to do is get athletes and we try to develop them. Um, and that's the name of the game. And we got, and we get a, a bunch of them. Um, and my favorite question to ask well, when people are sitting in my office here is, are you willing to change positions? You know, and I'm usually sitting that with mom and dad right there. I mean, if a kid's not willing to sw switch positions, that's not a right kid for union. We want to, we want a selfless kid um, who's willing to change positions, even if I have no intent, hopefully they're not watching this, but uh, <laughs> even if I have no intent of switching their positions, I like asking them because that means a kid want to play, wants to play. He wants to be able to um, help his team in any way and do what's best. So, um, you know, I, I like asking that question, but it, de develop player development is huge. And we do that by trying to get as many touches as possible, um, doing a lot of game play and a lot of free play, um, you know, and, and with our defensemen, a lot of footwork, but a lot of offensive uh, skill development as well, even with the, with the long poles. How many players did you ask the crack question to, if they're willing to switch positions and they said they are not willing to switch positions. Zero. Zero. Yeah. There's not one of those guys on this team. Some yeah. of our best players are uh converted attackmen or um, you know, LSM's playing close defense or defensemen playing LSM, or we sometimes we switch them to defense and midi. Um, you know, we we've had attackmen go to defense and midi and uh be really, really successful. So um, you know, we're gonna find roles for you somewhere, somehow. Tell me a little bit more about how you're able to utilize your staff to have the development, because I think a lot of coaches, um, not, not head coaches or assistant coaches in particular, but there is like a delineation of uh, responsibility, right? So in terms of your offensive coach and your defensive coach, how much responsibility are you giving them to develop those players and how much are you um, weighing in on that on either side? So, so we have a small coaching staff here at Union. It's it's myself and um, Marcel Godino, who who, who primarily runs the offense. But um, you know, I expect him to run defense as well. Um, you know, we're, we're we're coaches together, and we don't really have sides of the ball. I mainly ho focus on defense, but uh, I coach offense as well. So all of us are supposed to be doing all everything at once, um, which is hard. Um, but that's what helps in some of the player development is he's not just looking at offense and I'm not just looking at defense. We're coaching every part of the ball um, as best as our can to our abilities. And then we also added a, um, a volunteer assistant this year from the football team, Devin Smith, who's doing a great job coming from Cortland state um, as, as a first year coach who's coaching football in the cross here at union. Can you walk me through a typical union practice without exposing any any secretive things that you guys do like what is your what's your warm-up look like what's your um second drill third drill fourth drill kind of focus on yeah no there's no secrets here um you know we we, we stretch we get straight into sticks um you know two to three stick skills drills um some of those are competitive some of them aren't depends on the days um then we primarily go into offensive defensive split um you know, where we split up offense, defense, and depending on the day, do, you know, shooting or um, skeleton and defense will do, um, you know, footwork and, and um, you know, stuff with their sticks and checks. And then uh, we usually get to some sort of small side of games um, where we split the team in two. I, I'll have half the team. Coach Godino will have half the team. Um, and then we'll end practice with, um, you know, transition drills and clearing drills. And then uh, usually scrimmage, and that's about how we run every single one of our practice. So uh, we kind of build up from the ground, um, ground level, and go straight into um, full field and and competitive games right away. How much has the program changed? The practice plans changed since you were a student athlete at Union. Uh, not much, if you ask uh, a lot of the alums. Uh, we're doing a lot of the same stuff. Um, you know, maybe a little bit more nuanced. When Coach Warren was here, we were doing a lot of uh, one-on-ones, two-on-twos, three-on-threes, which we still do at times and, and use them. But uh, it's more of a um, a built-in, a four-on-four with it, what starts with a one-on-one, something like that. So um, it, we like to play. 
and I think they get they get better most by playing. Um, we will have dr drill aspect of our practice, but the more we play and with the large number, you know, with 50 guys on the roster, um, we want to get those guys involved as much as possible. And then then you got to take the weather into consideration as well. Um, it's cold in upstate New York right now. So um, a lot of standing around and teaching doesn't go over well in, in February. So um, we want to keep us moving as much as possible and make seven second corrections as a coaching staff and then uh, move on to the next one. So you do a lot of like game situation drills where it's a fast pace. You're always moving guys on standing around, focus on as many touches as you can get situational stuff. Yeah. There's not a lot of six on six going on in our, in our practice. If, if you throw the ball away on offense, the ball comes down the other way and we got to clear it and the other team is going to get a, an opportunity. So uh, th that's how we like to kind of drill our six on six in more of a self full field setting as best as we can. I have kind of a hot take. I don't believe in one-on-ones. Tell me, tell me why I'm, why I'm wrong. I just don't think they, I don't think they develop players. I think it develops bad habits. I think they, you know, even at the college level, I just don't buy into it. I think the better drill is two on two because then you're actually doing in-game simulations. But I feel like every time I see a coach like doing a one-on-one, -on -one, if you're not doing it in a small group and then educating both sides of the ball, what's the point? Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like a lot of one-on-ones, especially like, I mean, at the lower levels for sure, it's just guys running in a long arc and getting a yeah. shot off. And it's like, what is the point of this? I hate watching this. I've seen so many so many programs do that as part of their thing. And I'm just like, oh man, you got to stop doing this. It is lacrosse is like past that. I feel, you know, like you don't see like one-on-ones and like basketball drills or like any other drills, right? Unless well, like, there's constraints, unless there's I, constraints. Like uh, if you put a, a, a passing constraint or a, uh, or, or constraint the field a little bit, um, right. I think it could be really beneficial. You know, when you see basketball players do one-on-ones, a lot of the time they're playing one-on-ones with three dribbles, that's all you got max. Right. So you got, you got to make your move in a tight space and go. Um, but, but I'm with you. It, it's really hard to play one-on-one. -on -one. It's a pretty useless drill unless um, you need to evaluate defensively who can guard and who can't. That, that might be the best part of one-on-ones. Of -on right. I think a lot of coaches at the younger ages and even maybe less developed programs do one-on-ones because – it's easy and it's something to do. I think when you do a one-on-one -on -one drill, you got to ask yourself, all right, why are we doing this drill? W what are we getting out of it? Or what do we want to get out of it? And to your point, Kyle, yeah. I think having more players on the field, you know, game situation, yeah, you want to get a step on your guy to create a slide, right? So it's not about beating your guy. It's getting getting space, creating space for the teammates on the opposite side of the where the ball is and where right. that where the initiative initiation takes place right and it's also like i mean our one-on-ones were almost like a punishment when i was playing at clark especially because like the def the defenders were either really big and slow or they were really tiny and fast so like especially at x that you would catch and go right at least that was a nice thing we put in catch and go one-on-ones right where you're catching and you're going from x and it was just kind of like okay well now i have to remember how to beat each one of these guys but they're my teammates they're like my friends and they weren't you know, I love you guys, but you weren't very good. So it was like, okay, all I have to do is faint this way, get inside and shoot. You know, I, all I have to do is I'm more worried about the goalie saving the ball than beating the guy. And that didn't help anybody. Right. Well, like you, you really should have gotten some better defensemen. At, oh yeah. At, no, at, at, for at sure. Okay. I, listen, I'm not saying I was good at all. I was just saying I was less bad. Well, they must've been Again. really bad if you were beating them all the time. I'll tell you that. Hey, My goodness you, you want to do a foot race after this, uh, this well, podcast? Well, you get a few Is years. That what you want? You got a few years on me. Listen, so, I will I tie you, my but, leg. To if, if I was, I would have <laughs> loved to have played defense on you. I would have taken that long pole. I would have gotten a wooden long pole and, and played defense you on you. You got put in the game as the riding team. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> I played the whole game, dog. No, I played the whole game too, but I was on the riding team. So. <laughs> yeah, you got hey, put back in for extra Team. Coach, you have a riding team? <laughs> oh, I wish we did. We did when I was playing, I'll tell you that. You did. God. You did have a riding team? That that was yeah. that was a uh, common ground in the day, you know. All right, riding team because you had so many whistles back then. They oh, the horn. Horn, you could yeah. stop all 10 guys if you wanted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I have a good follow-up for that. What, what are your thoughts on the 10-man? Because, like, I'm thinking about putting it in this year. 
I'm thinking about doing it with high school. Can I do it? It's probably better in high school and college, right? Probably great, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, I don't know. I, I have mixed feelings about the 10 man. It, it's obviously a big part of the game in college now, and you got to be prepared for it, um, which I think we are. And and we do run it um, at times. And I think we run into some, some special situations like, you know, after uh, extra man, Turnover and uh, face off back to the goalie is a great time to run a 10 man. Um, first ride of the quarter is a great time, but um, I don't know. I, I, I don't love it. I don't love it um, as part as a viewer. I don't love the, the well, 10 man. You don't want to see big, big goals from goalies and, and defensemen because that's what I, should happen. But I way. hate the shots. I hate the shot, the long shots. That's what I don't like. Yeah, you're right. But you're I a mean, defenseman. You don't want to see that? I wasn't allowed to shoot. <laughs> That's awesome. But the challenge with the 10-man ride is all 10 guys have to be yeah. on the same page, mm -hmm. executing at the same level. When you're in a regular ride, you know, if the team clears the ball, you, uh, the, the risk is not as great in a 10-man ride. If they clear the ball on a 10-man ride, you know, the goalie's got to get back in the cage. Guys are out of position. So you really got to be executing 100% of the time. Yeah. You, you have to have a number you're willing to give up you know, in a 10 man. And, um, you know, for us, that's three. And I don't, if I'm looking at a game, do I want to give up three goals in a 10 man for maybe three goals we could score from it? I, I, I sometimes don't want to take that risk. I think I think we're pretty good in, in the goal and pretty, have some pretty good defensive midfielders now. So let's just get our guys on and um, stop you six on six. Looking to keep up with all the latest news and information on new England lacrosse. New England Lacrosse Journal and LaxJournal.com are the premier resources for information and inspiration on the New England lacrosse scene. Have every issue of New England Lacrosse Journal, the magazine, delivered to your home or office. And don't forget to stay in the game every day with a digital subscription to LaxJournal.com to receive daily digital lacrosse coverage on club lacrosse, college commits, prep and high school, Division one, two, and three colleges, showcases, rankings, and much more. Get in the game and behind the scenes now by logging on to laxjournal.com. Just click on the subscribe button and start the subscription that is right for you today. New England Lacrosse Journal is a Siemens Media publication. Siemens Media, inspiring, informative, insightful. In just a few short weeks, the 2023 boys high school lacrosse season will be getting underway. Why not get a jump start on your season and attend the Interstate Preseason Training Day on Sunday, March 19th at Wheaton College? This event is open to all high school age players that are interested in tuning up the lacrosse skills before tryouts begin. The coaching staff for this event will feature local college and high school coaches that will work with players to improve their skills and get their game ready for the season. For more information and registration, go to PiatelliLacrosse.com. More of a lock ride guy. I, I, we leave the goalie. Like, well, it's also a New Hampshire, like lower level high school. So like we, it, it, the chances that a good goalie can run across and score, I'll take that. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, like, I feel like that's actually less, less teams run that in the higher levels. Now they used to run it all the time and now they do it less because the goalies are way more athletic than they were. I mean, goalies now are like way more athletic than they were 20 years ago. And, and better decision makers. Oh yeah. And better, better sticks better ability to make that like long pass. It's not just like, Oh, I just have to stop the ball. Like, you know, if you, if you're recruiting a goalie, you know, you, you can't just look at the shot stopping, right? You have to look at the poise in the net, the ability to get the ball up and out, the accuracy on long throws, the ability to command the defense. Like all those things are, are very integral to that process. hundred percent. And then, and then this decision-making, you know, when we started a freshman goalie uh, in 2020, and I was super worried about his decision making, you know, but he ended up uh, being a great decision maker with a great stick. So, um, but that's, that's tough as a freshman. It's tough as a freshman in the college level. Kyle, I disagree with your philosophy on leaving the goalie alone all the time. I used to like to watch the goalie in warmups and see how he handled the ball. I'd like oh, to, sure. I, yeah, I'd yeah. like, I'd like to, you know, test the goalie to see, what he's like under pressure, see how he handles it, how he handles the ball. And to your point, coach, this, the, the decisions he makes with the ball. Right. How do you coach decision-making with it? With, is, is it just a lot of scenarios that you're running through? 
a lot of a lot of reps um and then a lot of film you know um you guys know everyone learns in different different ways so you, some guys see it on film they won't make that mistake again you know even though we, we've done it 20 times in practice so you know we we film every practice and 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 we'll cut it up and um send clips to individual players to make sure they um you know they can correct some of their their mistakes they're making Coach, talk about some of the players um, who have actually maybe surprised you a little bit early on in your first two two games. Well, we got a freshman LSM from Hingham, um, John Sula, who is um, a, a rising star, if you ask me. He's uh, he's been playing so well. We we felt comfortable as a staff moving our 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 second team all over your league out um, LSM Clint Gaudreau down to close defense. So we have a lot of confidence in uh, in John Sula right now as a freshman, um, but then Michael Shaw, a Piatelli guy, has uh, has been playing awesome for us and um, putting the ball in the back of the net and um, making really good decisions out there as a first year starter. Yeah, there's a guy Mike Shaw who's actually hit the weight room as well. It's gotten bigger. Um, always had a very good skill set. Um, he developed his footwork and uh, really is doing a nice job for us. It's nice to see. He's working really hard and um, comes from a great lacrosse lineage as well. You know, Absolutely. His brother, his brother starting at Harvard and his other brother being, I think, a two-time captain at, um, Providence. at Providence. And his dad, Chris, played at Providence as well. Exactly. Yeah, so uh, so, so the whole family came to the Babson game, and, and you guys will like this story. Um, Michael Shaw scored four goals in his first game starting. You know, I thought he had a pretty good game. And uh, I see both of his brothers and I'm kind of talking to him after the game and saying, hey, pretty good game for Mikey, huh? And they go, coach, what about that one-handed ground ball he missed in the second quarter? And they were just ripping him. <laughs> they were ripping him. <laughs> they said, you got, they said, coach, you got to cut that up and and rip him in front of the whole team. You know I what said, that's, I, yeah. Do you know what that is? That's Massachusetts, man. Older I'm, I'm sorry. Like, yeah, I'm sorry. Brothers. Like, I'm not from here. No, it's it's Massachusetts, too. It's not just because they're, they're brothers. Trust me. It's Massachusetts, too. That's like part of the DNA, right? Like, I feel like I mean, I'm not technically from there, but I've spent like most of my life around in Massachusetts and around it. And it's very like there's it's just a culture of ball busting. It's cool. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not I'm not you're disparaging it, but that's so, so, so ingrained, but, man. <laughs> Uh, being from Massachusetts, one older brothers too, but also lacrosse family. They see those little things like yeah. how important that possession is, right? Why, why are you going after the ball with one hand, Mikey? Come on, you should be picking that ball up. You yeah, would have picked I, it up if you went with two hands, right, Coach? Yeah, they were generally upset with him, and they were not fussing. <laughs> they, and, and and I cut up the film, and and we yelled it. I told the whole story in front of the whole team, and everyone was dying laughing. But um. But but we yelled at Mikey in front of the whole team, and uh, and we cut it up. And I, he's not going to pick up too many one-handed ground balls from now on. <laughs> or if he tries, he's not going to come up with the ball. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get his brothers back on uh, over here. That's great. That's incredible, uh, Coach. Uh, speaking of that Babson game, you coached against your high school coach and Rocky Batty, which I didn't know until uh, I interviewed for, interviewed you for the Peter Burns piece. Uh, can you talk a little bit about kind of like it's a little bit of a homecoming, right? Like coaching against your old coach, like that's crazy. That's awesome. Oh uh, yeah, it's um, you know, it's tough. It's tough uh, playing against your, your your old coach. So you know, there's just such a great relationship there. But um, you know, it's also homecoming because I'm from Wellesley. You know, I went, I right. played at Wellesley High School. So um, you know, we had a bunch of fans there, and we do so well in Massachusetts. Um, you know, I think our our fans were really show up to that game, but um. You know, playing against Rocky is never fun, and um, you know we 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 got we're lucky to get away with the the win, but um, it, it's uh it, it's a little weird if I'm being honest with you guys. I I gotta tell you, man, I was I was we talked about it a little bit before where we're like, oh, you have a lot of mass guys. You're basically Massachusetts team in 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 upstate New York. <laughs> <laughs> like I went up and down your roster just now, trying to look at it. goal scorers, uh, cause turnovers, face off guys, uh, ground balls, and I'm like, every single one of these kids is from Massachusetts, so it's not even a pipeline. We're like a full blown, yeah, like wave of kids coming there and making a difference, and like really kind of showing the rest of the world what 
mass kids can do. I real, I honestly feel that way. I, I'm not just saying that because I'm talking to you on the. But on it's the call. also uh, from uh, Massachusetts programs that are very good. Yes, Sudbury, Hingham, Norwood, you know, Canton, Natick. Yep, I love I love Hingham kids, man. Hingham kids hit different. They're hard. Those kids are mean. I Coach Scott really does a great job with those guys. He does an awesome job. Yeah, they uh, they're they're pretty great on 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 social too. They they love when you talk about their guys. But I I, lo- I recruit a Hingham kid, man. You want a tough dude. And coach, I would imagine, and for sure, hundred percent, that where the kid comes from in terms of the program means a lot in the recruiting process. Hundred percent. You know, um, if, if and again, you start relationships and have started the pipelines. I don't even need to see a kid if Coach Todd is telling me this is a good fit for Union. I don't even need to see him. I'll take him. And um, I know what type of kid I'm going to get when he gets here. In in terms of your goals for the for the upcoming season, obviously last year was, you know, the best season in Union history. I think I think it's fair to say that, right? Getting the championship game, not not winning it, but putting up a, a great fight against RIT. Uh, still the number one team, even though they look a little bit less dominant this year. Um, is that goal exactly the same? And how do you think you're going to navigate that getting there again? Well, then getting in the tournament is the toughest part. Um, getting in the tournament is not easy, especially in the league that we're in. So uh, our, our goal is we got to make our Liberty League playoffs. Um, we want to ho- hopefully host a home game, and then we need to win the Liberty League to hopefully get a, a chance to win. You know, and if that's not possible with some of the other teams in our league, we want to go 50 percent um, of out of league conference or co- out of league conference games. So, um, you know, and who we're playing, that's no no tough task either. Um, we're playing a lot of good teams uh, out of conference, and that's what we want to do. We want to give ourselves the best chance to get in the pool C bid if we don't uh, make make if we don't win the Liberty League. So um, once and once you're in the tournament, anything could happen, as, as we showed last year. You know, um, you got to just. You got to grind out some wins, and I think we have a team and a, uh, a culture that we can win uh, back-to-back games and grind out some games against anybody. So um, our, our goal is getting in there always. I mean, part of the part of doing this podcast is kind of educating a lot of you know parents and stuff that maybe don't know where these schools are and and what leagues they're in. And, and I'm just going to read off some Liberty League teams so you guys understand how good this league is. You know, St. Lawrence, RIT. RPI, Ithaca, these are perennial top 20 teams in the last, not just the last five years, 10 years. We're talking 25 years of top teams. Like the, this league is a murderer's row, 100%. And we talk, listen, I write all the time about the NESCAC. The NESCAC is great. I would say the top half of the NESCAC and the bottom half of the NESCAC are different teams, but you don't really have bottom half of Liberty League, maybe one or two teams that I, I didn't list off, but maybe not because at least those those games are competitive. Like all of your games are tough to win. You don't just roll up and beat St. Lawrence. You don't roll up and beat Skidmore. You know, you don't roll up and 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 beat RIT for sure. So how how what what do you think is the separator for you guys? What do you think that you've done, in, especially in the last three years, to really kind of put you guys over the top? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I I think this is a player driven culture and um, they take ownership, you know, and, and me being a player at Union, I want them to have ownership of their own program. Um, so I think that helps. These guys are invested. They want to win. Um, you know, they want to prepare and they want to eat and sleep. So they give themselves the best chance of winning. Um, so I think that's a huge part of it. But every team has a great culture that's going to be. Um, winning a lot of games. So I, I think the big thing that distinguishes us is is how hard we practice and um, you know how 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 much we we buy in defensively, um, where it seems like a lot of teams are are into playing fast these days. And um, yeah, you know, we like doing that as well, but um, I think we do it with a little different edge. Coach, other than the lacrosse program, why do players? find union a good fit for them in terms of the academic piece what kind of programs does union offer that may attract a number of massachusetts players yeah yeah so um you know we have a really good liberal arts program 
which attracts a lot of, uh, you know, econ majors, which is pretty standard in lacrosse. But we also have a top 10 engineering program, which is very rare in a liberal arts school. So I think that uh, can draw from a very big pool. Um, we're also halfway in between, you know, three hours to Boston, three hours to New York. So I think we get a lot of people that, you know, might want to be working in Boston and or New York City after they graduate. Um, and then I think they have a chance to play against some of the best teams in the country and I think the best league in the country. So I think that's going to be a, an opportunity for someone that's ambitious and that wants to play at a high level and get a great academic uh, education and degree uh, to somewhere like Union. And they also are only taking three classes at a time because we're on the trimester system, which I think is fantastic for all athletes. You know, it's a little sped up uh, 10 weeks at a time, but um, three classes, you have a lot of free time to do things that you're passionate about here at Union. A lot, of, a lot of preps do that. Like prep schools run on trimesters. It's, it's, it's well, actually like an easy transition. Yeah, but they're taking five classes still. Or, That's or true. Six classes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're only taking three, which is, which is really nice. Um, gives us time to, you know, do lifts and, um, you know, films throughout the day uh, without affecting their schoolwork. Coach, making it to the championship game last year, do you think – Having that experience going forward, if you make it to the NCAA tournament this year, it will benefit you going into the tournament? And if the answer is yes, how? Yeah, I, I think it'll benefit us by giving, the, giving the, the players on the team hope. They know this is possible. This isn't, this isn't a, uh, a slogan on the locker room anymore. This is a lived reality that they've experienced or a lot of them experienced and they know they could, they're able to do it. They know this is a good team. And if they play the game the right way and give it their all, they're going to give themselves a chance to uh, go pretty far. You know, we just got to, we, we got to put ourselves in a good position um, throughout the year to, to, to make the tournament. And then we got to get, get a couple breaks and um, you know, see what happens. Well, Coach, we appreciate you coming on. We wish you the best of luck in the, the rest of your season. And um, really great having you on. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having us. Me. Thanks a lot, Coach. Appreciate it. Yeah. Bye. Thanks again for listening to New England Lacrosse Journal's Chasing the Goal podcast. For Jack Piatelli, I'm Kyle Devitt. We'll see you next time.